This video is about the lies and garbage that Garrett told on national TV for that screwed up 169 show. Now that Mary Garofolo chick who ran the show and narrated it and filmed it and did a lot of the other parts of it and edited it didn't tell me. She was very evasive and deceptive when she was meeting with me trying to hide the true motive of what she was trying to do a documentary about. She calls it news journalism but her producer called it a documentary and we have that on film on Bloke's channel. So since I didn't know Garrett was even going to be involved in this video but I knew the other people who you've seen were I couldn't defend myself about what Garrett was going to say, but now I can. Now at least I'm going to tell the truth, and it's very easily verifiable. These are several witnesses which are still online that anybody can talk to and communicate with if they want to. Now I met Garrett in January of 2008. He found me online on YouTube like every other person does, and he just constantly harassed and bugged me and emailed me and so on and so on and so on. He even looked up my phone number and called me because he wanted to come to the farm and participate and he, all he wanted to do was talk about tempos and he was telling me how great a driver he was since he was seven years old since his dad had a body shop and a long parking lot where he could race his cars up and down in because he always collected old scrap cars and would help his dad junk them so I went I met both of his parents first before I allowed this uh, kid to come up here and the first few times uh, he came up well he brought his parents of course well they wanted to check the place out and all was good Garrett was an unusual looking child to me. He was 12 years old but you couldn't believe it. It was hard to believe Garrett was actually a 12 year old kid. He was about 5 foot 11 when I met him and weighed almost 200 pounds. I'm only 5 foot 11 and a half and I weigh 185 so he was already bigger than me in a way and he said he was the second or first biggest kid in his whole school. So he started coming out in the winter time first several times like I said his parents brought him and he couldn't do much with cars then he did drive the drive the redneck roller coaster a little bit on the plowed driveway and eventually he got his dad to bring out one of his old tempos and he was jumping his tempo on a snowbank well he continued to come out throughout the summer of 2008 along sometimes with his friends mostly on the weekends his parents would drop him off at my place and I had dinner a few times at his mother's place Garrett has a very hot mother Garrett's a lot bigger than both of his parents. He weighs almost as much now as his two parents put together. Well, as everybody who's been around David's farm for a long time knows, the Hater Club started in July of 2008. So right away what the Hater Club did was identify, or do their best to, any children that were coming to my farm, and they would call the police and they would call the Children's Aid Society. They wrongly believed that I wasn't allowed to be around children, when in fact it totally wasn't true, because throughout the last seven or eight years I was raising my own teenage son you know and I raised him since he was 13 that kid is Adam so in August 2008 eventually the children's aide did try to get a hold of me I'll show you I still have the business card from the person who is called Ron Matabal extension 340 the London Children's, children's Aid Society well he didn't get a hold of me right away because every afternoon I was at the farm but he did eventually get a hold of me while I was at my home in London in early September and he said that he had already talked to the police and he had already talked to Garrett and his parents and told them his concerns and told them about my history from 20 years ago so Garrett was completely aware at least since uh, late July or early August of 2008 of everything about me and the police of course and Children's Aid had talked to his parents in spite of all that Nothing wrong had ever happened, so Garrett was allowed to keep coming out, and he kept coming out. Now we're going to jump a year and go all the way to August of 2009. Well, that summer's evening was a very busy evening, like Garrett said. There was a lot of people here, a lot of adults, a lot of kids. There probably was seven or eight kids. But we're going to talk about the kids who were involved in what Garrett was talking about on camera and tell you the truth. And like I said, you can contact these kids on YouTube and anybody else involved and get the truth from them too because there's several witnesses. By the building that evening, as common in the summertime, we had our little fire pit going and some people sitting around the chairs. And some other people were over yonder there where the beach is over those hills. And I was hanging out here most of the time too with the other people. Inside the building were Garrett, his two friends, and this 12-year-old Garrett is talking about in the video that 
Garrett made. Or at least the one that Mary Garf Garofalo made with Garrett. Well, I got up and I walked into the building to grab a beer, which is pretty typical for a Saturday night. And I heard some uh, unusual sounds, like suspicious sounds upstairs with those kids. Walked up those stairs to see what was going on. Lights were off. I'll turn them on just to show. And this strobe light was going, which sits on the corner of the chair. And there was the naked 12-year-old there dancing. Well, Garrett was standing right where that pool cue was at very close range, videotaping him. And his friends, these two friends I was talking about, which I'll show you in a minute, were just behind him on the other side of the pool table saying, Garrett, Garrett, don't do that. That's illegal. That's child porn. You can't do that. That's wrong. You're going to get arrested. And I was scolding Garrett also. He didn't turn the video camera off right away. I think he did it for about one minute. Well, there's the strobe light from the other point of view where I was just standing. So I scolded Garrett for what he was doing, and that pissed him off. And then a short while later, I went back outside to sit with my friends. Well, there's a picture from that fateful night we were just talking about. You can see Bloke and Rick and Pug. There's the red-headed Phil kid, whose name is Phil that I was talking about. Garrett's other best friend, I can't remember his name, and Garrett. Those were the other people in the room except for the 12-year-old. None of those kids' parents were there that night, but there was a whole lot of adults here that weekend. So about a half hour later, I go back in the building, needing another beer, of course. So while in here, I hear a ruckus going on upstairs. And then I hear a big thump. So back up the stairs again I check on what's going on with those same kids well what had happened was Garrett had gap, grabbed this cushion off this couch and was using this part as a handle and he was chasing around that hundred pound twelve year old well at this point in time now we're talking about 2009 and Garrett got a lot bigger now he was six foot two and two hundred and thirty five pounds chasing around a hundred pound kid with a cushion swinging it with all that velocity well anyways he connected the kid against the head and the kid hit his head right there well of course this kid was a lot shorter than I am so this was where the top of his head was hit his head right on that steel beam and he got knocked out there's lots of steel beams in here and steel walls not a good place to be beating on a little kid by a guy who weighs you know almost two and a half times as much but anyways within a very short while the 12 year old woke up crying in pain and a big bump forming on his head. I scolded Garrett a whole lot this time. Really gave him shit and that made him really mad. The 12 year old wouldn't stop crying for a long time so I walked him out of the room and just we both sat here on the edge of this bed for about 15 minutes while I tried to console him and stop him from crying and tell him everything was going to be all better and I'll keep you away from Garrett. If anybody knows Garrett they know how bossy, manipulating, and overpowering he is, even to his parents. I've seen some very good examples. Well, anyways, later that evening, I kept the 12-year-old away from those other three kids the whole time, although I don't know if there was any problem with the other two. I just know there was a problem when Garrett whacked them out. And now it was time to go to bed, and Garrett told the truth this time. Yes, there was only two places left to sleep. One on the other side of my double bed, or in the room with Garrett. Well this kid was scared shitless of Garrett and wanted me to protect him and he did not want to sleep anywhere near Garrett and Garrett had been bothering him the whole evening. So we both slept overnight in a double bed with clothes on never once ever touching each other not even rolling over and I got up and left at 6.30 in the morning while the boy still slept. I always go home first thing in the morning to feed my cats and then I come back to the farm so I, let, I was home that Sunday morning. Well, it didn't take very long somehow that fall and the hater club got a hold of that night. Well, yeah, they heard about the videotape. They heard about the boy sleeping with me, although nothing happened. And they heard who's ever side of the story. I don't know. I don't pay attention to what's going on in the haters world. But they heard all about it. And then the hater club started telling everybody and claiming that they had a copy of this video or they had the original. I don't know, but they said they had this video. 
Well, and they said the police were contacted and the parents were contacted. Oh yeah, the parents were contacted. The haters doxed this kid. Well, doxing them means to try to find, con them to get information out of them, find them on Facebook or find them in any other way to get their phone number, their address, call their parents, call the person, harass them on YouTube, harass them at home. Well, this kid and his parents, even though, a broken up fa even though they were a broken up family, both parents got relentlessly harassed and he quickly went off YouTube and at the end of this video I'll post a copy of a message that was sent to me by his best friend explaining the situation of what the haters had done to him. They really messed him up. He did nothing wrong. He was a victim of Garrett's abuse. Now imagine what Garrett did. He made child pornography, he possessed child pornography, and if he did give it to the haters, that's distribution of child pornography, and then we have the assault. That's assault with a weapon, so that's aggravated assault. They're calling me, the, Garrett's calling me the bad guy, and he committed four crimes that night, but it gets worse. Wait till you hear what happens the next day.